Brother Michael, I appreciate that very much. Appreciate Brother Michael Hatcher and the good work he does in the Brotherhood and here at Bellevue. And Brother Brantley and Brother Stancliffe and their godly wives behind all these men. We certainly appreciate them and uh, the Bellevue congregation. You know, the church here at Bellevue, it's not a congregation of several hundred members, but yet the influence of this congregation goes far and wide in the brotherhood. We're so thankful for them and appreciate the prayer led by Brother Denham and the good singing led by Brother Brantley, as he always does an excellent job. You know, this uh, theme this week reminds me of that song popularized by Frank Sinatra and later by Elvis, My Way, I Did It My Way. Well, here at Bellevue and the brethren in this lectureship and the faithful congregations represented are not interested in doing it my way. We're interested in doing it the Lord's way. And Jesus said, Straight is the gate, and now is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it, Matthew 7, verse 14. And we find that even fewer and fewer in the brotherhood seem to be finding and traveling in that way today. And so we're always going to be in the minority. We need to understand that in this whole world, and now, sadly, even among the Lord's people. You know, uh, one thing I was thinking about getting ready to speak is... We've had several children and young people here for the lectureship, and we have a few this morning. Uh, I want to commend these children and young people for their good behavior and attentiveness. And I just want to say that because some people have this idea that you've got to be entertaining young people all the time. That's really a discredit to young people. When they say the only way you're going to get their attention is to entertain them. I've heard people say things like this. But certainly that's not the kind of young people that we've had here this week and children. So we're so thankful for them and their godly parents and grandparents. And we want to commend them as they remember their Creator in the days of their youth. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse number 1. You know, this idea of baby... Dedication, just like a lot of these other innovations, uh, on the surface they may appear harmless to a lot of people or might even seem to be a good thing to people. But yet further investigation into the Scripture, as we prove or test all things by the Scripture, Acts 17, 11, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, and then hold fast that which is good, which proves to be authorized, that is, which is, may be done in the name of the Lord Jesus, Colossians 3.17. But this is an innovation in that it cannot be proven to be done in the name of Jesus Christ by His authority. In fact, uh, I had to do a little research into this thing of baby dedication or child dedications myself. On a website called gotquestions.org, it said, in the majority of Protestant denominations that practice it, child dedication is a symbolic ceremony undertaken by Christian parents soon after the birth of a child. Some churches perform these ceremonies in mass and have several couples and children participating at the same time. The rite is intended to be a public statement by the parents that they will train their children in the Christian faith and seek to instill that faith in them. The congregation often responds through responsive reading or some other method to affirm that they, as a church family, will also seek to encourage the parents to bring up the child in the faith. There is no implied salvation in the ceremony, and it varies from church to church. End of quote. In fact, uh, in the book, and I'm not going to go through this, but there is an example of a child or baby dedication ceremony uh, among the Lord's people there in the book. So you can read that over and get an example of what they do. But I think one thing that's important, though, is to read 
at least one example of a rationale given for this particular process or ceremony uh, on voices.yahoo.com there is the rationale given in the example of Hannah dedicating Samuel to the Lord and of Mary and Joseph presenting Jesus to God in the temple. It says, quote, that that belief is the foundation of dedicating one's baby to God to receive blessing and guidance in rearing the child. The Old Testament reference of 1 Samuel 1, 27-28 is often cited as a reference for baby dedication. In that portion of the scriptures, Hannah and thanksgiving and appreciation of God answering her prayer to bear a child, vowed to lend her son, Samuel, back to God as long as he lived. A New Testament reference in Luke 2, 21-22, describes Mary and Joseph going to Jerusalem to present Jesus to God. Now, I'd like to say here at this point that while the example of Hannah's commitment to the Lord is indeed a worthy one, and of course the example of Joseph and Mary, these are in no way parallel to the modern innovation of baby dedication. Not at all. We read of, uh, for example, Hannah in 1 Samuel 1 verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. 1 Samuel 1, 11. Thus we understand that uh, Samuel had the Nazarite vow upon him, as we can read about in the old law and that he was dedicated to the service of God. And Samuel became one of the greatest men of all time, a great and godly priest and prophet of the Lord. Now one thing that I'd like to say here about Hannah is that she had the right attitude and the right view of things. Her idea was that you show gratitude to God by service. If God would bless her with a child, then she is going to be sure that that child, and specifically the man-child, would be dedicated to the service of Jehovah God. Now that's a marvelous principle there. Many people look at a child as like, uh, you know, a toy or a plaything, and certainly we love to cuddle and to kiss and to hold our children. That's the way it should be. But yet that's as far as it goes with some people. They look at, well, having a baby, that's like uh, getting something to play with for a little while, and then you just kind of let it go out on its own. And I'm afraid some young girls look at this like that. Well, I want to have a baby. Well, you know, a baby is a great blessing from God and something to be loved and cherished, and indeed it should be. But yet Hannah had the right idea. It goes beyond this. A child is something, a person, a human being made in the image of God to be trained for the service of the Lord. And if you think about it, Hannah had the right attitude that all of us should have in bringing children into the world. Yes, they're a blessing to us to enjoy. And well, we should enjoy them. Children are inheritors of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is His delight. Psalm 127 verse 3. But the greater purpose is to help them to know salvation in Christ and one day to enjoy the eternal home in heaven with God and in the meantime for them to be trained in the service of the Lord to do the work of God. That's the grander purpose of having a child and not just for earthly reasons but for spiritual and eternal reasons. We know that those involved in modern day so-called baby dedications or child dedications do not give their children over to the care of the leaders of the church to, be, to live with them, to be entrusted to them throughout their life. Moreover, the Bible does not uh, require us to do that. And we, of course, know that 
Jesus was born and lived under the law of Moses until he finally took it out of the way, abolishing it, nailing it to the cross, Ephesians 2.15, Colossians 2.14. And by so much as Jesus made a surety of a better testament, Hebrews 7, verse 22. But Samuel and Jesus both lived under the law of Moses. And we don't do that today. Now, what was done regarding Jesus being brought to the temple... And we read in Luke 2, 27, the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law. And at this time we read Luke 2, 21 to 24, has its background in Leviticus 12, verses 1 through 8. Now here we read in Luke 2, beginning at verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer, uh, here's a significant point. In Leviticus 12 and uh, verse uh, number 8, a provision for those was made for those who were unable to bring a lamb. That they could bring in two turtles or two young pigeons. So I want to read this and make a point about that here in Luke 2 verse 24. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now we've talked about implication this week as one way that the Bible authorizes. What does this imply about Joseph and Mary? It implies that they were not people of wealth. And when God chose a couple in which to bring up his only begotten son with the Holy Spirit, with the miraculous conception, the virgin birth, but Joseph being his earthly father, not biologically, but in the sense he came up in his home, and mother, his mother being Mary, his natural mother, he did not choose people of great wealth. He chose people that were humble and lowly and God-fearing, God-serving people. And that's a significant point. Now, we know that there are wealthy people who are faithful and godly to the Lord. We understand that. But yet, Joseph and Mary were not people of means, but yet the more important thing is that they were faithful unto God Almighty. But now, as we move on this morning, talking about baby or child dedications, we notice that there are many members of the church today who want to be like the denominations. And I believe one of their two of the brethren brought this out yesterday. The idea that a lot of these things that we get, these innovations, we get them from the denominations. And in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we remember how the children of Israel said to this godly Samuel who grew up to be an old man, they said, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They wanted to be all like all the nations. Many of our brethren want to be like the denominations. They want to ape the denominations. They want to be like them. And to get such things as baby dedications and other innovations. I'm sure that a lot of people in their ignorance of the scripture or their lack of study have done this thing, the baby dedication, with good intentions. Whenever we think about good intentions, at least one person I think about is Uzzah in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Uzzah had enough regard for the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony, that when the oxen shook the animal-driven cart and they stumbled and shook it, we know that he reached up to steady the ark. He didn't want the ark of the covenant to hit the ground. He had good intentions. But my friends, one of the great lessons that we have studied this week in this great lectureship 
is that good intentions without divine authority equals sin. And that's what we have in such innovations as baby dedications. People may have good intentions, but yet without the truth of God behind it, what good is it? It's not being obedient to God. I would like to look at an example that I found from the Westlake Church of God, so-called, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And here is a quote, a statement on the application. They give the parents who want their children to be dedicated in a baby dedication ceremony an application to fill out. And I wondered about that. Does this mean that those who do not fill out the form cannot dedicate their babies to God? But anyway, this is what the quote says. Baby slash child dedication is the practice of Christian parents presenting their child to God in an act of dedicating themselves to raise the child in the Christian faith and asking for God's blessing upon the child. Baby slash child dedication is a holy covenant between the parents and God. I'd like to look at that point for just a moment. The idea of initiating a covenant with God, human beings initiating a covenant. Brother Wayne uh, Jackson, and of course I wish that we could say that he's saying where he ought to be on the fellowship issues of today, but he does have some good material. And on this particular quote regarding uh, baby dedications, uh, especially making the covenant, he says this. Here is the intriguing question. Are men empowered with the right to initiate covenants with God in which they invent religious ceremonies or institutions that have no basis in established authority? Consider, for example, the Lord's covenants with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Israel, David, etc., those nobles of old were not permitted to be innovative in such relationships. See Leviticus 10, beginning in verse 1. Note, when Josiah was described as having, quote, made a covenant before Jehovah, end of quote, 2 Kings 23, the meaning simply is that he was confirming the covenant previously given by the Lord, verse 3. A similar situation obtained in 2 Kings 11, beginning of verse 17. Well, this is a significant point here that men do not have the authority to initiate covenants with God. The bringing of a covenant always was initiated on the Lord God's part and not man's. Now here are some relevant questions regarding baby dedication ceremonies and some questions that really need to be asked. Number one, if this is an important work for Christians to perform, why do we find no precedent, and as we're saying, command, example, or implication from which we may draw a necessary inference of it in the New Testament? Why is there no authority for that? Why do we have nothing in the New Testament that indicates we may do it in the name of or by the authority of the Lord Jesus? Colossians 3.17 who has all power or authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. Number two, this is a very significant question here regarding baby and child dedications or any other ceremony that we might come up with and institute in the church. Is it necessary to perform a ceremony to God whenever we decide to be dedicated to God in a certain area of life? That's a significant question there. For example, we know that some people in the church, they, of course, are baptized, they're babes in Christ. At first, they don't give really as they should. They need to grow in that area. They grow spiritually. They come to the point they realize, you know, I'm not really giving sacrificially on the Lord's Day as I should. I'm not giving upon the first day of the week as I truly have been prospered, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. When people reach the point that they decide they're really going to give as they've been prospered, do we need to on one day, one Lord's Day morning to have a giving as one as prospered ceremony? Do we need to have that kind of ceremony? 
What about when a man decides to dedicate his life to preaching the gospel? Does there need to be a preacher dedication ceremony before the church? Do we need to have that? Or what about when a godly woman decides to dedicate her life to teaching children's Bible classes? Should we have a teacher dedication service? I know we have uh, teacher appreciation uh, get-togethers uh, in the church sometime, and certainly there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's, everything's done according to God's Word, having a dinner to show our appreciation for them. But we're talking about instituting a religious ceremony in the church, in the service of the church. Do we need to have a teacher dedication ceremony? And we could go on and on with this. Do we need to have a ceremony for this or for that or in other ways that we may become dedicated to God in a more serious and sacrificial manner? Number three, here's another pertinent question. Is not the everlasting covenant of Jesus Christ, the New Testament, which God gave and which is made possible by the blood of Christ, Matthew 26, 28, the blood of the everlasting covenant, Hebrews 13, 20, the only covenant that we are bound to as far as our relationship to God is concerned? Is that not the only covenant that we have today? Is it not all sufficient to embrace all of life? every area of life, including how we're going to bring up our children? If we do not have enough appreciation for Jesus Christ and His shed precious blood, every drop of it, until when the Roman soldier cast a spear into his side, the water followed the blood out of his side. He shed every drop of His blood. If we don't have enough appreciation for the covenant of Christ, than that, that we have to start making other covenants. Then certainly we do not realize and or we do not appreciate what the New Testament is all about, the new covenant, which Jesus has given us. And then, of course, the question that we've already looked at, does man have the, spirit, the scriptural authority to initiate covenants with God? Absolutely not. But now here's a fifth question that's very important. What is the meaning of baptism into Christ? When one comes forth and makes the good confession, 1 Timothy 6, 12, of which we have an example that the Ethiopian gave in Acts 8, 37, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and then goes into the water to be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38, and we have the example in Acts 8, 38 and 39, is not this the dedication of the whole person unto God? At this point, a person becomes a new creature and all things are become new in Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Henceforth, his life is dedicated unto the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One of the most serious things about the child dedication ceremony is what it implies. It's what it implies that we need something after we become Christians to solidify our dedication, some kind of religious ceremony, as if our conversion to Christ did not imply or indicate that within itself. I'm sure that many of us have read or heard the story about the man that was going to the baptistry and had on his overalls, and they told the man, I said, wait a minute, you got your wallet in your pocket. You know, don't you want to take that out? He said, no, I want to be baptized, pocketbook and all. You know, he understood symbolically uh, that when he became a Christian, he was going to dedicate himself and his giving unto God, which many members of the church do not. Many do not. Moreover, uh, have you ever heard people in the church talk like this? Well, you know, uh, I was trying to decide whether I ought to go to Bible study tonight or not. It's Wednesday night. You know, people that make these decisions uh, every week, well, should I go to Sunday night service or Wednesday night service? Friends, that decision should have been made when we went down into the water to put on Christ in baptism. 
That decision should have already been made, as well as giving as we have been prospered, as well as searching the Scriptures daily, Acts 17 and verse 11, as well as praying without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, and all those things that embrace being a true follower and disciple of Jesus Christ. The words of the beloved apostle in Romans 6, beginning at verse 3, indicate that baptism is when we dedicate ourselves unto Christ because it's then that we come into Jesus Christ having heard and believed the gospel, Acts 18, 8, Romans 10, 17, Romans 1, 16, repented accordingly, Acts 8, 2, 38, making the good confession, Acts 8, 37, and then being baptized in his name for the remission of sins that he might, his blood might wash our sins away, Acts 22, 16, Revelation 1, 5. But Paul said in Romans 6, beginning at verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Newness of life indicates dedication to Christ and the kingdom of God first. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. You know, this also reminds me of the story one time of a young mother who was a member of the church. This is reported to be a true story. And uh, she had become delinquent in her attendance. And of course, we're forbidden to forsake the assembly of the saints, Hebrews 10, 25. And as Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, Matthew 6, 33. But an elder was doing the work of an elder. He went to see this young mother. And she used her child as an excuse as to why she missed the services. And this elder asked her a question that provoked her repentance shortly thereafter. He said, what if God took away your excuse? Now that's a question to think about, isn't it? God has given us these precious children to bring up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. And yet many parents want to make excuses. It should be understood that when Christian parents bring a child into the world, that they themselves will be dedicated to God. There shouldn't have to be any kind of a ceremony to go through in order for that to happen. Now here's another example on Christianity.about.com. And all these references are in the book, but you can uh, go to the websites and look at them. Part of this says, a baby dedication is a ceremony in which believing parents and sometimes entire families make a commitment for, before the Lord to submit a child to God's will. Think about that. To submit a child to God's will and to raise that child according to God's word and God's ways. Well, friends, there are many references in the Bible that teach that every individual submits himself to God. No one can do it for us. And certainly a little baby doesn't even have that ability to make that choice. Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, 23. If any man will, whosoever will may come, according to Revelation 22 and verse 17. The parents cannot commit the child's soul to God because, number one, the infant already belongs to God. Uh, this is one of the, the great problems that uh, many uh, anti-brethren don't see. When they refuse the idea of giving a dime of the church treasury to a child because they say he's not a member of the church, well, that child belongs to God. But of course, we may do good unto all men anyway with the Lord's funds, Galatians 6, 10, especially those of the household of faith. And secondly, when he or she reaches the age of accountability, he will have to make the decision for himself anyway. 
as to whether they're going to submit themselves unto God. We know that the parent certainly can instill the truth into the child and must, as Timothy's parents did. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1 5, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Where did Timothy get the faith? Well, chapter 3, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And certainly parents have to set that godly example for their children. We know that Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5 and verse 16. But as we know, friends, little children belong to God already. That's why when an infant or a little child goes into eternity, we, don't, we certainly are stricken with grief. But we don't have to be concerned about where that little child's soul is going to be in eternity. And David understood this in 2 Samuel 12, 23, when he said concerning the child conceived and with Bathsheba that he conceived and that died, can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Jesus said, suffer little children and forbid them not, for I of such is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19 and verse 14. We know that there are some implications we want to look at here before we close shortly. Since baby dedications are not found in the New Testament, this practice implies that more is needed than what we already have been given in the Scriptures. And Paul teaches that the Scriptures are able to thoroughly furnish us unto every good work there in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Moreover, it implies to us that the eternal plan and purpose of God for the church, Ephesians 3, 8 to 12, is not sufficient. In other words, the acts of worship that we have when we come together are not sufficient to instill in us the things that need to be instilled. The Lord's Supper, Acts 20, verse 7, Acts 2, 42, the singing, Ephesians 5, 19, the praying, Acts 2, 42, the preaching and teaching, Acts 2, 42, Acts 20, verse 7, the giving, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. It implies that these things are not enough for us to do when we come together. We need to add a child dedication ceremony to it. Well, God has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. 2 Peter 1, verse 3. Man is very presumptuous to think that he can add anything to the sacred plan of God and improve it. And certainly, we cannot. Well, I want to say this in the closing uh, 15 minutes that I have left. Or is it... How many... About one, four, four minutes, okay. I want to say this, friends. This is one thing I want to bring in this morning. I think we can all see readily that baby dedications are not right. But one thing that we really need to bear down, and I'm firmly convicted on this in the local congregations where we preach, is the importance of our example and our teaching of our little ones and our young people. We have such an important task here in the Lord's Church. We have lost many in the brotherhood to compromise and apostasy and unfaithfulness to the truth as we've talked about this week. We are going to have to strive to instill in these little ones the truth to the point that they will want to obey God and to be faithful to Christ. This story was uh, related of a man who was a member of the church and he became a drunkard and he had two sons and they followed his example. Well, this man in his later years decided that he was going to repent 
And he did, and that's a good thing. But he went out to try to correct some things that he had done wrong. He went to one man, and he said, I've, I'm going to pay you back the money that I owe you. I've, I've owed you $100 for a long time. I'm going to pay you back. And he left feeling good. And he went to another man. He said, I've told some lies about you, and I want to repent. And I'm sorry. And he went out the gate feeling good. But on the way home, he passed the cemetery where his two sons, who had followed his example of drunkenness, were buried. And he said, you see that over there? That's my influence. I can't change that. I can't change that. As Paul said, no man dieth to himself, and none of us liveth to himself. Romans 14 and verse 7. You know, one time there was a story related of <clears throat> these three little boys, and they were having a conversation. They were, you know how little boys brag on their fathers, and one little boy said, well, my dad knows the governor. Another one said, well, my, my dad knows of such and such important person. Well, this other little boy, he, he couldn't think of anybody like that. But he did remember one thing. He said, well, my dad knows God. Well, he didn't realize it, but his father overheard that. And he went away and he got down on his knees and he prayed to God that his son would always be able to say, my dad knows God. Now John tells us this, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2 and verse 3. So parents and grandparents and adults, all of us, if we will work on knowing God ourselves and being close to him, that we're going to be the kind of people for our precious children and precious young people that we need to be. Then we can say with the godly Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then it will be proven, as Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Thank you, friends.